November 2nd, I think, yes, it is November 2nd, and this is a meeting of the City of Montpelier Development Review Board. Uh, my name is Kate McCarthy, and I chair the board. Um, I will go through the other members and have them unmute and introduce themselves. Uh, so the other members are Abby White. Hi. Abby. Joe Kiernan. Hello. Roger Kranz. Hello. Hey. Jean Leon. Hello. Um, Kevin O'Connell. Hello. And Michael Azarcha. Good evening. Hi, Michael. All right, thanks for being here, everybody. So um, we're also joined by Meredith Crandall, whom you know, she is our zoning administrator. And then Tammy Furry is on as the recording secretary. And this is being uh, broadcast on ORCA and also recorded for posterity. Um, so we will start out with a staff review of how we're doing things, given that we're on Zoom instead of in person. And for that, I'll hand it over to Meredith. Thank you, Kate. I'm gonna do a quick share screen. This is mostly for people on ORCA. Um, the share screen part. Uh, all right. Um, so, as Kate said, um, this meeting is being um, uh, streamed via Orca Media, um, and it is it can be you can participate in the Development Review Board meeting via the Zoom platform. So, I have up here. If you're at home watching at Orca, I'm going to leave this up. So, here's the link to be able to access directly in. You can also call into the meeting and participate via phone. And we have a meeting ID and password for getting in. This is mostly for via the phone option, but sometimes you have to do it via the Zoom as well. Um, you can download the complete meeting packet off the city website. Oh, huh, I don't have the link. If you go to the city website, it's there. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, you can email me right here if you need that link. Um, and, uh, also, if you're having any other problems accessing the meeting. Um, if you're in the meeting and you're having trouble accessing the video conference feed features, then you can message me through the chat function. Um, so just so you know, during this process, your video, using your video is optional. Um, public testimony is gonna be taken verbally. And as noted previously, the chat function should only be used for troubleshooting or logistics questions. Um, chats will be added to the public record if they're used. Please keep your microphone on mute when you are not speaking to reduce background noise. Um, and for those participating by phone, star six will allow you to mute or unmute if you don't have a mute button on your phone. Um, if you're interested in speaking in a particular matter and didn't say so, then please raise your hand. That's not really an issue here. We only have one permit tonight. Um, if you're on via phone and you need to raise your hand for some reason, star nine will allow you to do that and it'll pop up as a raised hand on the Zoom um, platform. Um, we do have several members of the public on tonight, not just the applicant. And so I'm gonna go through the participation process. Um, once you've raised your hand and the chair has recognized you to speak, then please unmute your microphone, confirm that you can be heard, Provide your full name and address for the record. Um, you're then free to provide your questions or comments. We ask that you try to keep them to two minutes. Um, board members will then have the opportunity to respond or ask questions of you or possibly the applicant. The chair may grant additional time for speakers who have follow-up questions or comments. But then once you have finished, we're gonna ask that you mute your microphone again. Um, the chair may then move on to somebody else. You can provide additional input later, but only after the chair recognizes you again and we go through the full, you know, you don't have to give your, state your name and, and address again, but you do need to be recognized by the chair. Um, in the event the public is unable to access this meeting, I would probably get notified via emails, um, it will have to be continued to a time and place certain. If you're having connectivity issues, Try turning off your video or closing other applications that are on your phone or computer. And if you're having trouble seeing the document screen share, all files are uploaded to the agendas and minutes page on the city website. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be done by roll call. I'll now hand this back over to the chair. All right, thanks for that overview, Meredith. Um, so yes. Uh, that is the staff review and how people can participate. Next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. 
Um, are there any modifications to the agenda from board members? Okay, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Kevin. Second the motion. Second by Jean. All right, I'll call the roll. Uh, Abby. Yes. Joe. Yes. Roger. Yes. Jean. Yes. Kevin. I didn't hear. I saw you, Kevin, but I didn't hear you. Would you test the unmuting? Yes. Sorry there you are. That. Great. No, that's all right. This also confirms that your mic works, so it's a dual purpose. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Yes. And I vote yes. So we've approved the agenda. Very good. Thank you. Um, comment. The next item is comments from the chair, but there are no comments from the chair. Um, so we'll move on to item six, which is meeting minutes from October 19th. And the folks who can vote on the meeting minutes are Kevin, um, Abby, Joe, Roger, Jean, Kevin, and myself, because we were all present at that meeting. So um, are there any changes to the minutes as printed? Okay, then is there a motion to approve those minutes? Motion to approve. Very good, motion by Jean? Second by Joe. Wow. Second by Joe. Um, very good. Motion is second. I'll call the roll of those who are eligible to vote. Abby. Yes. Joe. Yes. Roger. Yes. Jean. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Thanks, Kevin. And I also vote yes. Okay, so we have approved our minutes from October 19th. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to move on to the um, to the only application for this evening, which is 713 Elm Street. Um, if I'm looking off to the side, it's because I have notes over here on another computer, uh, just in case you wondered. Um, it's a request for a vi for variances for the area of a sign and the height of a sign, as well as a request for extended sign lighting hours. And it may be other than that, and so we'll, we'll hear more. Um, so the first thing that we do at this point is anyone who wishes to speak on the application, I'll swear you in. So if you're here to be heard on the application, or even if you think you might want to pipe up, um, go ahead and uh, raise your right hand. Okay, great. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Okay, I see nods and thumbs up, so I'm going to take that. Thank you. Thank you both. Great. So, um, Meredith Crandall, could you please provide us with an overview of the project? Um, yep, I'll give it. This is going to be very brief for people who haven't done this before. This is going to be more, a little more on process, on sort of the procedural aspects of it. And then, um, likely, I'll go over to, I'm guessing, Emily to describe more of the details on the project itself. Um, so, Northridge Nature Center is revamping its signs. Um, well, it's one major sign. Um, my understanding is and from the application, there's been issues with people not being able to read the current sign due to its size and location. Um, and the existing sign is larger than allowed under the current regs that was allowed when it was put up. Um, but they're coming back and asking for an even larger sign. So unfortunately, that's not something I can approve. It's not within the standard um, allowance in the regulations, and we don't have, our current sign regulations don't have a waiver provision for this aspect. Um, and, but we're stuck with the regulations we have. So it's moving them into a request for a variance, um, which as the DRB members know, has slightly different criteria to go through. Um, so really the, you know, there's multiple things to look at um, when it comes to you know, the height and other things, but really it's the, my sense is that the size variance is going to be the biggest issue probably. Um, it's really more of a, a threshold question, even though the staff report talks about a lot of other criteria as well. Um, and that, that discussion, just to orient everybody, starts on um, page seven of the seven, yes, sorry, page seven of the staff report, which is page 11 of the full meeting packet, just to orient people as to where that big issue is located. Is that good for you, Kate? 
Good for me. Good okay. For me. So yeah, um, great. So what we'll do next is turn to, it sounds like Emily will be providing a bit of an overview. So yeah, we'll give you an opportunity to tell us briefly about the project, um, including just confirming what you're seeking a variance for and generally speaking why. And later on, we will be walking through the individual variance criteria as well as criteria related to signs and lighting more generally. And you'll be able to speak then too. So this isn't your only shot. Um, but if you want to tell us uh, an overview, take maybe five or so minutes. I'll turn it over to you, Emily. Thank you very much. Um, so um, as Meredith pointed out, uh, our current sign is um, smaller than the current regulations allow. Um, and it's also considerably smaller than we would like. Um, we are just a couple of miles out of town, two miles from the center of town. Um, but the speed of traffic by the time you get to North Branch um, is the speed limit is 35, which means, of course, the range of speed people are actually traveling um, is, you know, uh, there and north. <laughs> um, and we're finding that uh, a lot of people, especially as our center has grown over the last several years um, considerably, and there are a lot of people coming to North Branch for the first time, um, people are not always finding us on their first drive-by. They're not seeing the sign, um, and or by the time they do, they don't have enough time to slow down sufficiently to make the turn safely. And so then they, some people go further and turn around in a driveway or at um, Gold Hill. Um, perhaps some people even go <laughs> further and then realize they've, you know, really headed out of town and, and have to turn around at that point. So we would just like a, a more visible sign, um, both in terms of size. And we also have a lot of evening programming, which didn't used to be the case so much back uh, when the first line was built 10 or so years ago. Um, and so being able to have some lighting on the sign so that it can be on during programming that happens in the evening, such as this time of year, um, we do owl banding in the evening that public is, the public comes to. Um, and in the winter, we do our uh, Friday evening naturalist journeys lecture series, obviously when COVID's not happening, <laughs> all of that is. Um, uh, so it would be nice for people to really be able to see the sign as they approach and uh, be able to, um, slow down appropriately before they turn. Um, as far as the size of the sign, uh, I mean, this was sort of all laid out in narrative. I don't want to repeat all of what I said in that, but um, the recommendation from Sparky Potter of Wood and Wood up in uh, the Valley was to have um, a letter height that is just impossible to fit on the, um, on the eight square feet of content area that's allowed. Um, and so, you know, in discussion with Meredith, we sort of, um, brainstormed a couple different ideas with, um, Sparky and, you know, um, basically came up with a sign design that was our logo. It doesn't give us the full six inch letter height that we would have liked, but the visibility of the diamond and our logo in general, um, uh, helps achieve that desire for more visibility um, as people come over the hill and around the curve and start cresting down and, and see from a distance. So um, uh, I, I'm not sure what else you would like me to cover right at this moment versus when you'd rather me respond to questions. So if there's specific things you'd like me to sure, that, address right now, I'm happy to. That's a great overview. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll take some general questions from the board. So Kevin, if you want to unmute and go ahead. Go ahead and unmute there, Kevin. I know. Every two weeks we kind of get back to it. It's <laughs> sorry about that. I'm zoomed out. I've been on Zoom like pretty much all day. Oh, well, uh, then. so anyway, uh, Meredith, uh, what can you just explain? I mean, there's a lot of paperwork there for what looks like a very minor amount of uh, of variance that we're looking for. What are we actually looking? What is the variance that's needed with the new zoning regs? So the way everything has been zoned, um, the North Branch Na Nature Center is in a pocket, you know, like a little pocket of rural that pops down in the rural zoning district. Um, and in the rural zoning district, when they rewrote the sign regulations in 2018, 
they limited signs, commercial signs, in that district to eight square feet. Um, and that is measured not, you know, it doesn't have to be the everything that goes into the sign, but it is the area of the sign message. Um, and really the smallest square you can really draw around the proposed North Branch, Branch Nature Center sign and get just the message. I think it was 12, 12 and a half square feet um, as proposed. So, I mean, it's an additional four square feet that they're asking to add on to what is supposed to be the maximum size for a sign. Um, you know, it's that, you know, that was a, a choice made by the planning commission, whether it made sense or not is not really my, unfortunately my job to be able to decide. Um, but it's, you know, there's, there's information in the application um, and certain resources that Emily has included in there, which are recognized national sources on what size lettering you need to have to be visible at certain speeds. The speed limit issue, and this is my discussions with Mike Miller as well, the planning director who was involved in draft, drafting the regulations. What speed limits are is not something that is was discussed or thought about when coming up with Montpelier sign regulations. It does have an impact. It is a, a potential issue. That's something Mike and I have discussed. Um, but the regs are what they are right now. So it's kind of in the board's court to figure things out, I'm afraid. Thank you, Meredith. Sorry if that wasn't actually very helpful. <laughs> no, I think you confirmed what I was saying, which is that, you know, this is this is raw material that we're looking at. Yeah. It hasn't been tested tremendously yet. So we're going down the path here for the really the first time. Exactly. Yeah. Abby. I'm wondering if you looked at other alternate designs that would enable you to have the proper letter height in the constrained environment that we have. I mean, Are you happy to share a screen, Emily, or do you want me to? Um, I uh, I didn't I wasn't prepared to share a screen, so um, I can share the app of the full meeting packet and scroll to if you tell me where to scroll. Sure. Yeah. So there's one figure in there that um, shows what the what is what basically a square. Um, um would look like with yeah there you go i don't know if you can full size that yeah so that page shows what um the the sign is the um the sign association the uh, international or national sign association um recommends 7.4 inches tall letters which sparky and i both think are is more than we really need but if you go by what the speed limit is for our area 7.4 inches is what they recommend and you can see that you can't even fit the last letter of or two letters of each of our words um in that in a size um in an eight foot square size for that if you scroll down to the next page i shrank the letters down here this is again an eight foot square eight foot square um and those are six inch tall letters where you can technically fit them all within that space, but that doesn't leave any usable space for our logo. Um, you know, the logo would have to be like really tiny down in the corner in order to fit on there. So that was one option is we could just put our words and not our logo at all, but we didn't feel like that was as strong of a sign um, and it's not as attractive as a sign. Um, so we decided to try just putting our logo um and when you put our logo at the eight square foot size it's so tiny that sparky just felt like that was really a non-starter so i said well what if we were to make the logo fit to 12 square foot which is the amount that would have been allowed if we were zoned the same as um, ccb and turtle island which are just a third of a mile to our south and this is what we came up with. So this is our um, 
first choice design. We did go through a couple of other design, you know, possibilities, which I could share by holding them up to my screen, um, but they were definitely not as popular and they also didn't really achieve what we were looking for in terms of getting the, the, the look of the sign. So um, I'm not sure, Abby, if you were wanting to see sort of other designs or if you were wanting to just hear how we got to this design. Oh, this is helpful. I just wanted to know if you looked at other possibilities and it sounds like you had. Yep. Yep. Questions, other, other general questions. All right, so, um, you know, folks probably reviewed our staff report and what you would have seen there is that a, th a threshold question before we talk more about whether 12 is appropriate versus 11 versus 14, et cetera, um, and whether the height being asked for is a reasonable variance to request. The first thing we're we usually look at as a board is the variance criteria themselves. And um, we call those threshold criteria because if they're not passed, then the other parts, it doesn't make sense to have them as part of the discussion. So I'm gonna look to the board for for some advice, like under normal circumstances, what we would do is we'd make this determination by voting in the meeting and then moving on and accepting more testimony. Um, for, for folks who are watching us for the first time, you may not realize that um, for the last month or two in this, in the, of the Zoom environment, we have made the decision to temporarily at least conduct our deliberations in a, in a separate non-public deliberative session. And we've done that so that we can come to good decisions um, by having a little, uh, an easier way to communicate in a slightly smaller group. Um, we've been doing this with all applicants, not just difficult ones, um, so that everybody gets uniform treatment. So where I'm going with this is, um, I want to ask the board's opinion about whether you would like to make those threshold determinations in the public session or, and then move on and accept testimony and do the rest in deliberative. That's one option. Another option is to take all the testimony about the variance criteria, the sign criteria, the lighting criteria, and then do it all at once in deliberative session. And I'm leaning toward that second option for the sake of consistency with other applications, but I'm also very interested in what others, other board members would think is the best process, the fairest process. And I know some of you have been on this board longer than I have, and I'm very interested in all of your opinions on that before we move on. So apologies to the applicant for having to sit through this little bit of process discussion, but um, thanks for bearing with us. Uh, Roger. Well, um, thank you, Kate. My memory of doing variances is, is that we arrive at very specific um, um, measurements, you know, of, um, a, uh, a two foot setback or whatever in this case it would be a eight square foot sign and whatever the height is and then once we've determined those specific um measurement uh, measurements then we go through the seven criteria because if you don't have the measurements then it's hard, it's hard to figure out the cri cri the seven the criteria and I'm kind of thinking we should do that in, in public, maybe not vote on it, but I think I think it's important for the applicant and, and everyone else to to hear what we how we um, how we how we uh, determine mm -hmm. each each of the criteria. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can definitely walk through the criteria, even if we then vote on them later. Um, before I call on Kevin, I would just note that the first two variance criteria are very general to the site, but then the later ones, like the applicant is proposing the least deviation possible, that does depend on the, the numbers that we're talking about. But um, that, that's helpful, Roger. Thanks. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to uh, uh, support, Roger, uh, your comments. That certainly is, is the, uh, uh, the time-tested way that we've uh, approached variances. Um, do other board members uh, have any questions or opinions about our approach to variances? Okay, and um, 
Meredith, you know, I'm, I'm going to say, when I say Meredith, I'm going to refer to, Mer it's going to be Meredith Crandall unless I say Meredith Warner. <laughs> so I just, I'll just make that easy. Um, so Meredith, who's to my left, um, I would like to ask your opinion about proceeding, um, taking into account Kevin's and Roger's recommendation. Um, I, should we look at the some of the variance criteria or just go through and take on the sign and the sign criteria and the lighting criteria and then go back? Um, I think given how fact specific this is mm -hmm. um, and that a variance on the size of the sign mm -hmm. is going to need to consider the full picture, really, mm -hmm. especially if this is going to be a unique situation, mm -hmm. um, that it probably makes sense to go through the full, the full sign discussion. Sounds good. Yeah, that, I, I think that's answering your question. Go I through that whole discussion, mm -hmm. and you can have the discussion about the variance, mm -hmm. and then maybe get to the lighting. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Um, board, any questions from board members about what about that? Okay, thanks for walking through that with me. I think that's important because if two or three or four, two or four or six or eight weeks from now, someone down the street comes to us with the very same question, I want to make sure that we've done it and it, that we know what we're doing and why. All right. So without further ado, um, what we'll do is we'll step through the staff report. What we're looking at today are the general standards and um, as well as some site plan standards. I'm um, just going to focus on those standards that are in question. Um, so, so I'll move on through. So the general standards related to dimensional standards, allowable uses, setbacks, demolition, riparian areas, wetlands and vernal pools, and steep slopes are not a part of this application. Those criteria are all met. Um, do boards, the board members have any questions or concerns to the contrary? Okay. Um, for erosion control, there's just a staff note that any project on um, any project needs to follow the requirements of 3008D. Um, these terms apply to the construction and we understand that to be part of the project. Stormwater management, access and circulation, parking and loading are all not, not affected. Those things aren't being changed by this one sign proposal. Um, but I will pause and see if DRB members have any questions, just to be sure. Okay, thank you. So that brings us to section 3012-3012, signs. And this is where we get into the details and, and why we're even talking about this. So as we've heard, the standard in this area is signs are a maximum of eight square feet in area and a maximum of eight feet high. That is the standard. Um, another standard to be aware of is that permanent ground mounted signs must be self-supporting structures and they must be built on and attached to concrete foundations. Um, so so let's, let's just start there uh, and then we'll talk about lighting, okay? So uh, we've, we've heard a request and we've heard some of the reasoning behind the request to go from the max, maximum standard of eight feet square to about 12 foot square. Um, do board members have any, any questions about, about that request? Abby had a good question. We can ask more detailed questions if you like. Okay. We can always come back to it if we think of something else. That, that is fine. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the height of sign that you are hoping to build and why, um, if you're requesting a variance for the height and why the height, why the height that you're requesting? Sure. So in and of itself, we don't, we're not interested in making a, a super tall sign, but we did want to um, follow Sparky's recommendation for a minimum clearance off of the ground of three foot six inches. Um, with the step back from the road and the slight curve um, that is that you know the berming of the road and the ground slopes down a little bit if you if we go any lower from the clearance from the bottom of the sign to the ground we're going to be getting to the point where you won't be able to see the bottom of the sign when there's snow piled up on the side of the road so um we really didn't want to go any lower than that yeah. the top of the sign as it's currently designed is eight foot 
three inches, so it's three inches taller than eight feet, if you count just the top of the sign. But the way the regulation is written, it's actually the structure that is the measurement that is supposed to be eight feet high. So that's where we really go significantly above that to, what is it, nine, nine foot eight inches. So, um, you know, we would be, you know, certainly have, Three and uh, you know if if that if bringing it down by three inches made a difference for if you felt like that would sort of get us closer to the the spirit of the um, of the law I I certainly am not going to quibble over three inches but I think that bringing the whole thing down so that the structure is at eight inch it's at eight feet would be a problem because then the sign itself would the bottom of the sign would start being not visible from drivers who are coming downhill. In this, especially in the winter when there's snow. Okay. Um, and um, I, I would just note that if if the sign were eight foot square, it would probably fit. It would probably be able to achieve the required clearance and the required height. Or if it were a, um, you know, it's kind of a square square sign. Yes. But if it were like a, a rectangular sign, more like that, right. um, was that something that you that you talked about the possibility of a different sign shape in order to kind of optimize all those dimensions? Um, we did look at other sign shapes. Ultimately, we thought that the um, the the best use of this of the square footage was to use the logo, which obviously is the diamond shape. Um, but yeah, we did consider some horizontal ones. And yes, if you did the text across two lines of text, North Branch and then Nature Center, that would be, you could make the, the sign height shorter. Um, I will also note that the, if we were zoned mixed use residential like CCB and Turtle Island are, I believe the 12 square foot um, sign area that is for that zone also goes with a 12 foot um, height. I'd have to go back and look at that, but if memory serves, um, the, there's sort of a proportionality between the height and the area of a sign. And so, yes, we're trying to fit a 12 foot sign into something close to an eight foot height. And this was sort of as close as we could get. So, so, um, excuse me, what, what is the proposed height again? Sorry. The total structure, um, nine foot eight inches, that's those two vertical cedar posts. Thank you, Meredith. Great, great, thanks. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, other board members, if you have questions, feel free to pipe up. Uh, oh, now I can see you well. Um, any, any other questions about the sign height? Joe, did you have one? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if you went over this earlier. I was reading some of the staff report here, but um, so the letters you're proposing on your proposed sign are smaller than the letters you have on your current sign. Is that, that's correct? They they're, are, they're essentially the same height. I think that they're within an eighth of, or a quarter of an inch of each other. Um, I don't have that number in front of me with the current it says that the letters. current, yeah, the current ones are four point seven four and three quarters, and the new ones would be four and three eighths. Yeah, which is not a lot smaller, but a little smaller. Right. And really, it's just the logo that's larger now. Right. Well, and it's also the words arranged into the logo. What the logo? This is the complete logo. The words around the logo, around the artwork, mm -hmm. is the logo. Whereas before. Okay. The old sign is the artwork pulled out separately from the words was how that was done. Um, I, I, I can't really speak to how that design was made because it wasn't there then. But um, the the impact, the visual impact of the logo, especially if, for people who've already seen it before, is considerable. And the fact that most of our visitors will have already seen the logo, whether they've gone to our website or seen an event on Facebook or um, seen our newsletter or anything like that. That's, I guess it goes back to the, you know, an image uh, is worth a thousand words. It, it, having, that, having that logo with the words around it is a, a visual reading that um, 
will kind of eliminate the, the necessity for people to actually read the words if they can recognize the logo. But the way that our current sign is where the artwork is kind of pulled out separately from the words, it kind of doesn't really do either. It's, <laughs> it, it's giving a, a letter height that's similar to this, yes, a tiny bit larger than this even, but the logo itself is sort of divorced from the words and rendered so small that it doesn't really have that impact that having our actual logo has. I mean, if I could have our actual logo even bigger, I, I would be delighted, but we didn't, we felt like it was important that we asked for the minimum variance that we felt we could get away with and have still be a readable sign and still felt like character with the neighborhood and felt not in excess of uh, the regulation for the MMU zone so close by. Um, and sort of felt like, I, I don't wanna ask for something that's larger than what Turtle Island and CCB could have. So we did our best to fit within that 12 foot area. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Abby, did you have a question? I was going to ask what the letter height is of the, the, the proposed 12 foot sign. And so we already answered that question. Yeah. And um, okay, uh, nothing else. All right. Gene, is, this did you a David, is this a David Cooch sign design? David Cooch is a, is he is he designing the sign? Who's the designer of the of the logo? I'm just curious. The the logo was designed by Linda Mirabile, who um is a local designer uh and um has been doing work for North Branch for Chip you would know better than me, but I think more than 12 years, maybe, 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 maybe the whole time we've been, our whole existence. So back when, since back when we were part of Vince, um, so 25 years, um, and Linda designed this logo, I guess, when we broke off from Vince, is that right, Chip? Or was it even when we were still with him? <laughs> He's nodding. <laughs> um, so Linda designed the logo, the sign itself, the sign proposal is designed by Sparky Potter of Wood and Wood up in Waitsfield. Great. The center, yeah, the think. decorative center post goes up four inches higher than the base, so it actually gives the area height, top height, 10 feet. Is that decorative center a structural piece to hold the top part? Does that go through the beam as a structural piece, or that's just strictly decorative? Like, I'm wondering if... By decorative piece, do you mean the triangular shaped thing that's above the logo that's black? Yeah. Yeah. That's actually the light. Oh, okay. okay. It reads a little funny from the front. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does look a little like a like a finial or something. <laughs> yeah. Because <finial. laughs> it goes into the structure also. It looks like it's part of the like it would go through that beam into the sign. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think. It, yeah, I don't think that it goes into the sign. I think it it, it goes um, into the beam, and then the electricity. There's a wire that goes in that beam and down the side. Correct. Yeah. But the black thing that's between the beam and the sign, that rectangle, yeah, yeah, that is just the way that the there's three of those that attach the sign to the frame. Perfect. Thanks. I always enjoy kind of hearing about the history and how things have have unfolded and including local designers and things like that so that's 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 good and interesting to know um i'll just remind uh, our our um board members that we we don't judge so much on the content <laughs> as on the 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 shape and the the compatibility of the sign uh the size of the sign the things that we can judge we need to be very careful about um the, the content so um uh, that's just a reminder for all of us. I don't think we were headed in that direction. But. Um, all right, so these are, good, these are good questions and I think we've gotten some good testimony on the sign itself, um, why 12 feet is being requested as opposed to eight. We've heard about the difference in height that is being requested for clearance for snow purposes. Um, looking at, let's see, are, are there any other questions about about this section about the signs. I just want to get back to the staff report and make sure I'm hitting the. Okay, 
So the next um, requirement of signs is that they be self-supporting structures, which this appears to be. It also, we have a requirement that they're attached to concrete foundations. And um, is this sign attached to a concrete foundation? That's not the recommendation of either Sarky Potter um, or Timber Homes, who are just up the road from North Branch um, and who we are planning on hiring to create the cedar posts and install. Um, the frame, Sparky Potter's wooden wood will create the sign itself, the white part, the sort of octagonal part, but, um, and the connector pieces, and they'll take care of the lighting, but Timber Homes would do the, the timber part and the installation. Um, so I, I went back to them um, after you flagged this, Meredith, thank you for that, um, and got some clarification from both of them. And um, so I, I'm happy to share what they said. Um, the basic just is that you you can use concrete to uh, put in your holes for this, but because it's a freestanding structure that's in soil, it's not attached to. Uh, we don't expect that there's any bedrock under there. It's 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 you know loamy soil, um, and it's not like downtown where there might be other structures or infrastructure that is, exists underneath the you know, by the time you get it down a couple of feet. Mm -hmm. um, it's, if we did concrete, we would have to protect the uh, posts from the concrete. Uh, concrete's really porous, and so it would basically be wicking moisture in from the soil to the cedar posts and actually contributing to the potential for rot. Mm -hmm. So what they recommend, what um, Timber Homes specifically recommends, and this is what they do when they do kiosks, um, which they, is a big part of their business, um, is they would have us dig a four foot hole, a little bit more, put some gravel in the bottom to protect the, um, the bottom of the posts from the soil, uh, put a sauna tube in, and then backfill with dirt on the outside of that sauna tube. So, you know, your hole is bigger than your sauna tube, this part gets filled with dirt then install the posts on the little bit of gravel that you've got at the bottom, a couple inches of gravel, and then backfill that inside of the sauna tube with gravel so that you uh, don't have any soil touching the um, posts and that would, should protect it. And cedar is already a very long lived, um, you know, species that's well known to withstand this kind of use. If we were to instead go the concrete option, first of all, it's not as environmentally friendly as a, of a product, um, uh, but I, I'm not gonna quibble over a couple of bag of, bags of concrete either, but the problem is that it, because of the wicking thing, you would still have to protect it from it. And it also wouldn't give it as much structural integrity as the um, process that Timber Holmes described to me. So if you had concrete, you would need to add a steel, what did he say, you'd need to have like a, um, a steel vertical piece that would attach to the um, cedar posts. The cedar posts are really strong, but because the sign is going to basically act like a sail. So if you picture a day like today where it was super windy, there's, there's the potential for racking where the wind would push so much force against it that even the timbers could um, could be affected by that. So he would recommend if you had to do, go the concrete route that you would have to also install steel, um, which then becomes a, a significant additional cost um, among other things and just isn't their recommended uh, process. So we were going with their recommendations for how to install it. Thank you. That's a lot of things that I didn't know before. It's really interesting to hear the- Me too. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kevin. Yeah, I'm just uh, Emily. I'm, I'm I'm surprised by the uh, by the recommendation for the uh, uh, for not using concrete because you you look at almost any um, uh, guide on how to build a fence or how to put in posts. It's, it, you know, the fixation is with concrete. So our ordinance says use concrete, but we're going to consider not doing that. Um, I think it raises a question as to the uh, uh, the best way to actually to anchor these things. Yeah, yeah, I was I was totally interested to learn about it too, and um, 
I asked um, the person I've been talking with at uh, Timberhounds is Timo Bradley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, if they have, you know, if you folks have more questions about this, he said he'd be more than happy to answer them. So um, I didn't want to um, ask him to come here tonight, but um, it, um, it, I'm sure he'd be happy to respond to questions if you have additional ones. I mean, from a construction standpoint, it would make it much easier, I think. <laughs> Um, I clearly am going to have to go talk to Timo so that Mike and I can, we, we were planning on revamping the signing regulations at some point anyway, so we're going to have to talk to Timo about that aspect of them. I think we want to be, uh, Meredith, I think we want to be careful. Uh, I, I mean, this sounds like a great idea, but it's also unconventional. Um, oh, yeah. No, it's, it's more of a, we have lots of things to consider, and it's something just to thought of. Yeah. reaching out to various experts when we get to that part of the regulations of rewriting right. I, mean, I mean i'm all i'm all for i'm all for giving this a chance using the proposed uh anchoring system that that's being suggested by the applicant uh but uh uh being the fact that uh that it is unusual um mm -hmm. I, you know if we're looking at a zoning zoning change we obviously want to vet that very carefully yeah. But it will, of course. Yeah, that's it. Well, let's leave that to the planning commission, and we can, we can maybe collect ideas later. Um, so, Meredith, if uh, it is not typical that we would grant a variance for a standard like this, often variances that come to us are for people wanting to do different things within their setbacks or different heights or things like that. So, is there a mechanism in our zoning that allows for? alternatives to standards like this at the DRB's discretion. What's our authority to do that? I mean, that's, that's, that is the variance option. Um, you know, yes, it's typically used for, typically it is used for your setbacks because somebody wants to build a building. You know, you can't use a variance for a use. Right. That's not allowed. Right. But any other physical measurement is a possibility, but you need to be able to go through those variance criteria. Okay, nice segue. Um, the next item in our staff report on page eight is those very are those variance criteria. So I'd like to, um, at this point, if, if it's okay with other members of the board, walk through those before we then go on to the lighting, because the lighting change being requested, I do not believe falls as a variance. Um, so board members, shall we go through the variance criteria? Okay, great. Um, yes, so one thing I just want to say about variances for those who haven't used them before, um, we, a, a variance is a very specific thing. The, as you read in the staff report, there are these five criteria, all five need to be met. Um, these these criteria come straight from state statute. So in order for a town to do a variance, they have to do it this way. And that's why these are written the way they are and why we're following them. Um, so let's just go through. Variance criterion number one. I'm just gonna read them in order to be specific. Um, there are unique physical circumstances or conditions, including irregularity, narrowness, or shallowness of parcel size or shape, or exceptional topographical or other physical conditions peculiar to this particular property, and that unnecessary hardship is due to these conditions, and not the circumstances or conditions generally created by the provisions of the bylaw in the neighborhood or district in which the property is located. So this has to, uh, this has to be a, a property-specific issue is, is what that means. So um, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. Um, Roger, yes. Well, I um, just to hop right in. I think that uh, the um, the uh, the several issues that the applicant enumerated the, the curve, the sight lines, the visibility, the speed, um, um, the hill, the snow, all of that stuff um, relates directly to this first uh, criterion. Okay. Thanks, Roger. Um, what are the thoughts of other board members? I'm wondering if there's a photograph or just any documentation that we could look at right now to look at the, the constraints of the property. I, I mean, I, I would I would back up uh, what Roger said. I mean, when you come down that when you come down the hill, uh, just after making that turn right before the entrance uh, to the nature center, um, 
it's you know the, the existing sign um doesn't really catch any would not catch anybody's attention i see this as a as an equalizer between the uh, the zoning that uh, the nature center has and the surrounding properties uh the community college and uh, uh turtle island uh, daycare uh, so uh, I, I would i would emphasize that the unique circumstances exist there other board members So I see this a little differently. Um, I'm very reluctant to make comparisons with the neighboring zoning district because um, there's a pretty distinct divide between the end of the residential and the start of much lower density residential and it's mostly residential uses after that point with the exception of a few of the home, home based businesses and Vermont timber homes, which is a conditional use. Um, I, I sort of see the nature center through through no credit or fault, no, through credit, but no fault of its own as being kind of the gateway to that new zoning district. And I think that's important. Um, and so I, I would not, in my own opinion, I don't see that parcel as a transitional parcel between the mixed use, um, mixed use medium, or whatever it's called, the, the previous zoning district and the one that it, that it is a part of. I see it as kind of the gateway property and the fact that it's a line and that there is different treatment is in order to create that transition, which is important. I, Kevin? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, would, I, I, I understand your point of view there, uh, Kate, um, but, I, but I do think that um, um, being that it's just the beginning of a of, the, of a different zoning district, uh, right again, right past uh, those two uh, additional properties. Uh, you don't even have to make that anything other than a footnote or maybe just ignore it altogether, but the unique circumstances still exist. So the unique circumstances about, for example, the topography and the road. Correct. Correct. Okay. Meredith? Um, so this is just a technical difficulty. I was trying to pull up a Google Maps or other things for Abby. Um, if everybody could stop for just a second, <laughs> it's okay. My battery's died on my keyboard, and so I actually can't pull anything up at the moment. Oh, if you can hold on, I gotta run to another room and get some batteries. Okay. I, I can pull it up on Google Earth. I'm actually looking at it right now. All right, Joe, why don't you go ahead and do that? Does that work for you, Meredith? Thank you. <laughs> go team. Thank you for the save. Is okay. this showing the correct screen? You guys can see the map? Uh, yes, Joe, we can. All right, so this is coming out of town. Uh, North Branch Nature Center is up here. And you can just barely start to see the old sign out there in the distance. And I believe that the new sign's location is going to be somewhere around here, closer to this telephone pole here. So you would be able to see it much earlier based just solely on the movement of the sign coming around this left-hand turn here. We're also going downhill here. It's not super obvious on here, but sometimes you can you come, tell the hill better going the other way if you go down. And yeah. Back. So this side, unfortunately, the car is over here in the right hand lane. So when you're looking at it this way, you you would be over here in this lane. You'd be able to see a little bit sooner, actually, or sight distance would be better. But you can see that the current sign mm -hmm. is pretty well hidden in here. But the new location would be somewhere around here. Again, we're going, looks like we're, are we going downhill again here? Are they in the low spot here? Kind of looks like it. It's a bit Maybe of a, a little bit. Yeah. So with the sign being higher, no matter which direction you're coming from, theoretically, the sign being higher would put it more in your line of sight. Um, it's not a whole lot higher than our regulations allow for anyway. So. So Joe, Joe, when you say higher, you mean the height of the sign. You don't mean higher up the hill. You don't mean closer to town. <laughs> right, right. The height of the sign itself, since you're coming in from higher up elevation-wise, no matter which direction you're coming from, mm -hmm. the sign would be easier to see being a little higher. You're going to see it sooner, especially coming from this direction, coming from out of, out of town, coming from town. Right. That's, that's a good analysis. I think um, while, while we're there, I just ask board members to think about um, how this image does or does not represent a unique physical circumstance that's different than other properties in this zoning district. 
Um, Cause that's the other thing we're, we're considering here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, Emily, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add that the, the proposed location of the new sign is only about 30 feet um, south of the current sign location. So it's, um, it's a little bit closer to traffic coming from the direction that um, from town, but not a lot. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's variance criteria number one. Is there anything else that anyone wants to add on that? DRB members or Emily or Chip? All right, so number two here, I'm going to read, because of, the phys because of these physical circumstances or conditions, there is no possibility that the property can be developed in strict conformity with the provisions of the bylaw and that the authorization of a variance is therefore necessary to enable reasonable use of the property. So, yeah, Roger. I think that's clearly the case. So the property property can't be reasonably used without this variance. Yes, as outlined by the uh, as as explained uh, by the applicant. Yeah. Okay. What I others? don't see it that way. I I don't I don't understand that. Yeah, I don't understand that either. Um, the the property will continue to be used whether there's a twenty foot sign an eight foot sign or no sign at all. Right. Meredith, do you have, and I'm put you on the spot. Um, do you, I know reasonable use is what, what we like to call a term of art. Um, it's something that comes up in court decisions and things like that. Um, is there anything that you can tell us off the top of your head about, about this standard? Yeah, I mean, typically when this situation comes into play, it's because you're looking at new development on a parcel that um, was subdivided previously, somebody bought it, you know, so it was already an independent parcel, legally independent parcel when it was created. Then somebody purchases it and goes to put a structure on it and they're like, oh, wait, since it got subdivided, the setbacks changed in my district, I got rezoned, so I've got different setbacks that apply or some other criteria, some other requirement. And now I can't build even usually the judgment that usually the standard is, can you at least put a single family home on it? That's usually the standard. Um, it's a lot, it's, it's, this is, it's a much rarer situation now that we have a change between waivers and variances to have a variance come in to say, we just want to, we, we want to, change how we're using it or we want to put this new thing in it's it is not going to stop some sort of use of the parcel um then usually it's you know that's that's the reasonable use that you can get a benefit from the property mm -hmm. um, and that you can have some use on the property that is compliant with the regulations yeah and the, the, the smallest reasonable use, the least impactful use is almost always a single family home. Hmm. That's usually the judgment line. It's interesting. That says as much about our court system and habits of zoning as it does about what you can actually do with these property. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. obviously the nature center does a lot of a lot of things that are very high value without being a I think you're right, Kate. Uh, mm -hmm. but I, I will say over the years, we've gone uh, kind of back and forth on that whole um, criterion and have uh, reasonable use is really an open concept. Mm -hmm. uh, what constitutes reasonable use? Is it like just because you have something there now that, that isn't broken, does that mean that's reasonable use? Or... You know, so I just just to put it in historical context, um, I think that uh, I mean I, I I agree with Roger once again on on the reasonable use question uh, 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 with regards to the uh, proposal. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. I think we can sort of take that discussion and then fold into it what we've heard from the applicant about their stated needs and when we consider this further. So I'll move on to criterion three. All right, Kate, can oh, I yeah, ask Abby. one question yeah. about this? Yes. So, so we're talking about enabling reasonable use, and I'm wondering if there's been any estimates on 
usage that would that has been affected by the poor sign and an estimate on what increased usage may look like with an enhanced sign. I'm just wondering if there's any data or insight that we can kind of use to make this determination around whether this is reasonable use or not. Hmm. I guess I would invite Emily to answer that or give it a try. <laughs> Oh, your mouse pad. Oh. Maybe um, I wonder if Meredith can unmute you manually. Are you able to unmute Emily? Nope. <laughs> Sorry, it just gives me the option to ask to unmute her. Oh, that's all right. We'll give her a second. We'll, we'll wait. <laughs> I'd also be happy to take a crack at this. Okay. Um, I, you know, and I, I don't think there's any data um, that we could really provide. Emily may, may have something um, that I'm unaware of, but um, you know, it's it's almost like how do you capture negative data? We don't know mm -hmm. who doesn't stop at the nature center um, if they keep going. Um, it's it's more of an issue of ease of ease, ease of access preventing people from having to go past the property, turn around, come back, or miss the sign at night because uh, it's not lit. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I agree that, you know, the property is, you know, used um, in all sorts of ways that are reasonable. It's, uh, it's more um, making it um, easy and convenient for people to find the property so they can use it. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next one. We're gonna give Emily a chance to supplement that answer if she'd like to. I hope she's not rushing around in too stressful a way. We will we, we will come back to this. Um, it's okay, we'll come back to this, Emily, in just a second. Sorry for the rushing. Um, I'll just read the third criterion while I'm getting set up. Um, it is that unnecessary hardship has not been created by the appellant. Um, so these, these circumstances that we're talking about mitigating for with the variance request are not circumstances that have been created by the appellant. So, you know, for example, if the appellant had built up a 20 foot dirt mound on the edge of the road and then wanted a 30 foot sign, that would obviously be something that the appellant had done. And that's, that's not really what we're seeing here. Uh, are there any questions about that one? Okay. Four, the variance, if authorized, shall not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the property is located, substantially or permanently impair the lawful use or development of adjacent property, reduce access to renewable energy resources, or be detrimental to the public welfare. Um, so are there any, any questions about this? You know, we've, we've, we've seen that the scale of the variance requested is, is a relatively minor given the size of the property. We based on the size of the property, we can also surmise that it will not impair the lawful use or development of adjacent property or reduce access to renewable energy resources. Um, welcome back. <laughs> um, does anyone have any um, questions or comments about this one? Okay, that was variance criteria number four. And Emily, um, thanks for Thanks for rejoining us. Sorry, um, that's, my mouse died. That happens, it's amazing. It happened to both you and Meredith at the same time. So it happened in a demo earlier today too on a call that Chip and I were both on, the person huh. demoing software for us. Her, it's like, it's, uh, it's today. It's something in the air. Solar, solar flares <laughs> or something. So um, we heard from Chip about um, whether there, in an answer to Abby's question about whether there is any data that shows just how much, what would the, what would the marginal benefit be of this, of the, improved sign and um, Chip said, you know, it, it is difficult to prove a negative to, to know what we're missing. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you would want to add to that. Well, um, I, I guess I'm not clear on when in the meeting it's, um, you're inviting public comment, but Meredith Warner is a neighbor and um, she, um, so she might speak to this. I've also heard from um, neighbors and from people attending programs that they sometimes miss the turn and then go a little further and turn around, which of course is a hazard in terms of 
driving on a road that's 35 more 40 miles an hour of traffic you don't really want people doing frequent turns in the middle of the road mm -hmm. so um there, there might be some safety benefit to it for sure um but I, yeah i don't know and i, I think I, I hope and trust that everybody who is trying to find us eventually does find us but is it is there some inconvenience is there um you know sort of a sense of am i here yet and right. you know it's this dark road at night and mm -hmm. okay all right kevin did you want to chime in no, I'm okay. okay. Uh, I don't know if I was making some gestures, but I was disconnected for a minute oh. and I'm just getting back in. Okay. You're fine. You're fine. All right. So thank you. We'll, we'll move on to that. And, and Meredith Warner, if you do want to pipe up at any point, please feel free to give away or on mute and we'll keep an eye on you so we can include you. Um, okay. So the fifth criterion of the variances, um, and thank you. I do think it is important that we spend time on these because it's kind of the crux of it. Um, the applicant is proposing the least deviation possible from these regulations that shall afford relief. And we've heard an explanation of why the sign height is proposed to be what it is and why the sign size is proposed to be with it, what it is. Um, are there any more questions or comments on that criterion? Okay. So I'm going to move on from the variance criteria unless anyone has anything else they want to add about that. All right. Thank you. So we've been through the general standards that included the sign standards and the variance criteria. And now what we are going to do um, is move on to the site plan standards, which is where we get into lighting. And like the general standards, I'm just going to note that um, much of this does not apply. Um, regarding landscaping and screening, the parcel complies with the landscaping requirements, but there is a staff suggestion that we request an updated landscaping plan because there's not one. Is there is there one on file now, Meredith? There is one on file from, um, I said, sorry, I don't have the date. I'm trying to it's do okay. a little tight research. There is one on file from, um, the previous large changes, mm -hmm. um, but even if we just got something with a slight annotation so that it's compiled, um, that, that would, would be helpful. It'd be, it, it's really what would be required to meet that. Okay. So is that, is that less about where certain plantings are and more about where the sign is on the site? Um, it, it's really not, enough. it's, it's more to, to meet that landscaping criteria, mm -hmm. um, of having a current landscaping plan because we hit, ran into site plan got triggered. Mm -hmm. That's it's just a check the box. Thing. I see. Okay. That's so all we need to make sure that we've got the most updated plan, even if that is some annotations to the previous plan. Yeah. Okay. Even if it's just taking got the it. previous plan and writing in, Oh, we're adding X, Y, and Z. Got it. Okay. Thanks. And would that be a, would that be a doable thing for? Absolutely. I, yep. Um, when I saw this in the materials, I was like, oh, right. I think I've seen that once in the past. <laughs> um, we, we didn't manage to dig it out in time for this uh, application. And I, I, yeah, that would be really easy for us to find um, okay. that again. Yeah. If you needed a Thank copy, you. I've got it here. <laughs> I might just come to you, Meredith. Thank you. <laughs> so that might, that's just housekeeping most current versions. Great. Okay. So that brings us to page 12 of the staff report in section 3204 of the zoning, which is outdoor lighting. And the, the key here is that we have a standard in the lighting that says in this district, um, lighting must be turned off by 9 p.m. or the close of business if later. The board may further limit the time period when signs may be illuminated as deemed necessary to achieve the purposes of this section and protect character of the neighborhood. And the request that we're receiving is, is the opposite of that. It's that the lights be allowed to stay on a little later when there are things going on. So um, I think it would be helpful if we could learn a little bit about um, when things happen and how late they into the evening they usually go. So like how many times per week or month and what are your usual ending times? Sure. Um, let's see, Naturalist Journeys pre-COVID happened on Friday evenings in midwinter. So starting in early January and going through, um, I would say late March at the latest is historically when it's been. And it's usually every other Friday, unless Valentine's Day gets in the way, something like that. So um, a handful of Friday evenings um, that would, you know, and it, it starts uh, at seven o'clock, I believe people, it's a very social, 
community gathering time, so people often come a little earlier. Um, but uh, the lectures start, let's see, do they usually go till 8.30? Is that sound right? Um, and then I would say we're usually completely finished by, like everybody's off the property by 9.30 at the latest. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think that's accurate. Um, the, um, and, and right now in the, in the COVID era, everything's, you know, the, the, that program's completely moved online, um, and has actually already started. We've, we've, um, in October, we started doing that series and they're on Wednesdays and, you know, it's just evolving as we go. And, um, so I, I don't know exactly whether we might expand that to be a longer period of the winter, um, come post-COVID days, it's really hard to predict. But if we just go by, by what we did in 2019, mm -hmm. um, that's yes, um, what we did. Um, the other typical late later in the evening um, season is October, um, maybe late September into early November is a uh, sawwit owl banding season. So this is when our little pint-sized um, uh, migratory owls move through our area and we um, go out in the evening and um, uh, capture them in mist nets and um, on some nights for public education, other nights just for scientific research collection, uh, data collection, we uh, band them, show them to people if there's members of the public there and then release them. Um, that goes on well into the night but the public portion of it is not, doesn't, I, I don't, it doesn't go, I don't think we would have the sign on, um, you know, till the wee hours. Um, to, uh, it's been a couple of years since I went, since I went to one of the public ones. Do you have a sense of when we usually wrap up in terms of when we would probably want to turn the sign light off and most people would have left? Those events can go as late as 10 o'clock. Sometimes staff are there even later. However, the sign doesn't need to be illuminated that late. Yeah. It's it's mostly for people arriving. Um, the sign doesn't need to be lit when they're leaving. It's just so they can find us. Um, you know, so it, it might only be on until eight or I'd say nine at the very latest. Mm -hmm. So it sounds yeah. like if we if we take some of these as a sample and these are some of the events when it's darker season, um, we're talking about usually about one one event a week or fewer and till maybe 10 o'clock at the at the latest yeah i think that's about accurate i think there's also the possibility of sort of one-off events like um mm -hmm. uh, you know a, a special event that might be an evening dinner you know sort of event where we might be open a little later um mm -hmm. but again i don't I mean, my Pilarites don't really stay up past 9.30. <laughs> so <laughs> if we have an event going till 10 and we're not getting out of, and we're not turning off the light because people haven't finished leaving the parking lot till 10.30, that would be a really rare okay. thing, I think. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, when we approved this, this, uh, the new site plan in 2016 or 17, there are some, there are some limitations on how late you can be open anyway. And I think they're like, I don't know if Kevin remembers that from, from then. But it's something like I, I'm not going to guess at the time, but this has been discussed such that it's not a 2 a.m. venue. Kind of place. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. That that gives kind of I think that gives a pretty good sense of what the what the impact of lighting would be. Um, do other board members have questions or concerns or clarifications that like regarding lighting? Okay. I guess I'm not really sure why we're really, it says right here, turned off by 9 p.m. or the close of business if later. Uh, mm -hmm. It sounds like we fall into that close of business if later category. So is there another reason why this is highlighted? No, I agree. I, th I think that we are we are sussing out what, what, what the close of business looks like and what later looks like and okay. um, determining that, that this fits in pretty, pretty well with that. So yeah, that's, thanks for, thank you, Joe. That does pretty much take it across the finish line. Um, okay. I think that's what we needed to determine. So right on. Um, we we don't need to think about the variance criteria for that. It doesn't make sense because it's in the standards. So, uh, Meredith Crandall. Um, just gonna let you know, and then you can you know ask if anybody else has anything else to throw in first. 
Um, I wasn't able to pull up an environmental court case that was looking at the variance standards that, and specifically talking, you know, goes into the purpose of the variances, if and when you're ready for that. Um, and then once you've checked in to see if there's any other public comments of people who are on here, I do have some um, additional emailed in comments that I received just recently. Um, that I would need to read into the record when you're ready. But okay. since we we're getting close to the end, I wanted to throw that out there. Good, good. Before we go rushing, rushing across the finish line, that's good. Um, so, are there any other questions from board members at the moment? Okay. Are there any other member, um, uh, any other comments from members of the public, even if you haven't spoken yet? Is there more of an official public comment period, or you're ready for my comments at any point? We're ready at any point. Okay. Sorry, um, um, I don't know if Meredith Warner actually got sworn in. I think you're right. I don't think, and so we need that and we would need your, when you're ready, your name and your address for the record. Sure, I can give comment now. Okay, can I swear you in, Meredith? Sure. If you wouldn't mind raising your right hand. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, just, uh, say your name and address and then go right ahead. My name is Meredith Warner. My address is 2068 Elm Street, Montpelier. So I live just north of the North Ranch Nature Center, um, two houses up, and have been a neighbor um, for five years. And um, I guess in relationship to the sign, I would say that the one that's there now, and my, you know, I that view that we saw on Google Earth is a view I see every day when I come to it from my house. The sign that's currently there is easily missed where it's placed. It's not just the placement, but the scale. Um, you're coming around a corner and down a hill on the way out. Again, you're going kind of up an incline and around again. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I can't attest to like why people use my driveway as a turnaround, but I would say that my driveway is is often used as a turnaround in my house that's close to the road so I see that happening um, and so people coming out of town might miss the north branch and my and my home is one of those places where people do turn around um, um, the north the new signage looks great to me the renovations that have been done in the last few years of the north branch nature center have included changes to the lighting that's been done in a way that is very respectful to the neighbors and of course is really respectful to the the environment and the animals and um, all kinds of creatures passing through so i i trust that the proposal would be used appropriately so when they say they're going to turn it off and only use it i i I'm sure, I'm sure that that's uh, an honest use. And, um, and also, I live uh, a little bit closer to the entry to Gould Hill Road, which is also, we have a street light down here. So while we I am in the, the part of Montpelier that's much more rural, um, we're used to having some ambient light, um, and it's not a problem. And I actually, I think from a safety standpoint, um, with the entry at use during events, it would be really useful to have better signage and some lighting there. Um, so I just wanted to uh, speak in support of the person nearby. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. I, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sitting through and waiting and, and then adding to uh, what we heard. I really appreciate that. Um, very good. Um, any other comments or questions? All right, so I mentioned earlier that we've been moving into deliberative session in order to deliberate. Um, and so at this point, what I would do, oh. oh I've, got to read, I've got to read the public comments. Oh, yes. At the very least. Go, go for it. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so this is a public comment from Leslie, L-E-S-L-I-E, Parr, P-A-R-R. -R. Um, she lives at 53 Cityside Drive in Montpelier, it's unit 11. Um, and she has been a member of the North Branch, Branch Nature Center for many years. And she says um, that she's very pleased with the lighted larger sign as designed. It is very dark near the center and the turn into the driveway comes up pretty fast. The lighted and larger sign will be a good indicator that the turn is coming up. 
in the winter months and with um, the North Branch Nature Center's evening programming, I expect the public will appreciate the larger and well-lit sign. The current sign really doesn't do the job, and I know that people who miss it have to find ways to turn around, sometimes on Gould Hill Road and even in driveways. Um, hoping your board agrees that our nature center deserves better, brighter, and bigger signage. Thanks, Leslie Parr. So that's that. Is there another one? There's no more public comment. I didn't know if you wanted me to bring up the, 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 the variance context or if you're all good with that. Let's let's not do that. Um, okay. I think I think thank you. That was some quick research. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't think we need to go into that um, at this point. Okay, great. Yeah. Would other board members like to learn though? I'm just one person. Oh, I just closed it. <laughs> I, I, I agree with your with your uh, assessment on that, Kate. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Now you know where to find it, Meredith. That's okay. Um, all right. So at this point, what? what i will what we will do is um, i will entertain a motion to close the public hearing on this application and move into deliberative session at the close of the public meeting is there a motion to that effect so moved motion by kevin second motion. second by jean i'll call the roll um abby yes joe yes roger yes jean yes kevin Yes. Michael? Yes. And I also vote yes. Um, the motion has been approved. So we will, what we will do is we will deliberate on this this evening, right after this meeting. And um, then just as normal, you will receive a written decision as soon as possible um, from the board with, with our answer. Um, that, that's all. Um, any, other, any other questions or, or last comments? We thank just have one additional item on the agenda, which is other business. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'll I'll get to that, but um, I want to I want to thank the applicants for for spending time helping us think through this and uh, for your descriptions. Uh, appreciate your participating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You had great questions, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and if you have other questions that come up during your deliberation, um, you know, pop me an email, or um, we're happy to keep talking if they're. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Chip. Good night. Thank you. Night. All right. So the next item on our agenda is other business. Um, the only item listed is that our next meeting is two weeks from today, November 16th. Um, is there any other other business or anything else you want to add about that, Meredith? Uh, not right now. Currently, we still have um, an item for that meeting. So. Mm -hmm. I'll keep you all informed. Um, I do want to just a quick little follow in note, and this is also for people who are watching this over ORCA. Um, City Hall will be open for voting tomorrow. Um, other offices in City Hall, however, will be closed. And then City Hall as a whole will be closed starting Wednesday um, after, you know, after Election Day for detailed cleaning and will not open up again to the public until next Tuesday. This is, you know, can be found on the city website. City manager's office has released stuff about this, but I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware. Good, thanks for taking that opportunity to get the word out. Um, any other announcements? All right, let's, um, we're gonna log off this public meeting. We're going to reconvene in deliberative session and let's do that at 8.30. Thank you all very much.